I greet you this Sunday morning at the Willows. My dear wife, Portia, is with me. And she says hi to everyone. And she also says, thank you for praying for us. This is the 19th of April, 2020. I will speak to you again on Sunday, the 26th of April. My scripture this morning on the 19th of April, 2020 comes from two places. And I want you Bible students to carefully reread, ponder on these things for they are deep. Among the seven or eight feasts of Leviticus 23, we read Leviticus 23 verse six. It actually starts from verse five. It says, in the 14th day of the first month at evening is the Lord's Passover. That was last Sunday. Then it says in verse 6, and on the 15th day, meaning immediately after Passover, the 14th, the next day on the 15th day of the same month, is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Notice how long the unleavened bread feast would go? Seven days. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. So if it continues seven days, it means that on the eighth day, which is therefore verse 11. And he, the priest, shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you, watch, on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. In other words, from one Sunday to the next Sunday. So we come from last Sunday the Passover, so on this Sunday of the 19th is another waving, the waving of the first fruits. I wanted to see how it connects with John 20 and 26. Thomas, had missed the first Sunday. I hope you are following. He was not there the evening of the Passover. So when does Thomas attend? The next Sunday, which is exactly what we have read. He then attends the Sunday of the waving of the first fruits, and we read, in John 20 and 26. John 20, 26. And after eight days, can you see that? Eight days after the Passover. And after eight days again, his disciples were within. I love that. Social distancing. <laughs> they were within, and this time, my own words, Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Verse 27. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger. And behold my hand, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Notice how 
on the Sunday after the resurrection, he encourages the saints not to be faithless. I'd like to entitle this message, The Thomas Weekend. The Thomas Weekend. Now this teaching is going to be very deep this Sunday of the 19th. And it is because the prophet of God encouraged us in 1961 07 23. God being misunderstood. Paragraph 25. It says, teach the deep things to those who are seeking deep things. Meaning that in every assembly, you will get your three different kinds. You will find the very shallow, very shallow. Then you will find those who are in the middle, but then you will find eagles who are always hungry. It's amazing how no matter what you bless them with the service before, when they come back again, they are hungry. That is why the Lord Jesus said to Peter, feed my lambs, Feed my sheep. Notice how they begin as lambs, but if you keep feeding them, they don't remain lambs. They grow and become sheep. I repeat before I proceed, you have just read it with me. It's very important that you don't miss this, that there are seven days between unleavened bread and first fruits. Therefore, on the eighth day, the first fruits, which actually rose the Sunday morning after the Passover weekend, on the eighth day, it's the feast of first fruits. I so rejoice to realize how that Jesus, merciful toward his disciples, appeared the evening of the morning of the resurrection and then reappeared the next Sunday for the sake of Thomas. This grace is unparalleled, brothers and sisters. It goes to show that if your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, but you are a little Thomas, missing services here, and maybe not reading your Bible, listening to the tapes, maybe a little slack here and a little slack there, I'm not saying you should become like that. But look how the mercy of God stretched itself out and directly addressed Thomas, singled him out, called him by name, and said, because you are a feel and a touch Christian, I'll give you that opportunity. But the Bible advises us, the Bible recommends, the Bible says, not to walk by sight, but to walk by faith. The next scripture I'm going to quote as we lay the foundation is Jeremiah 1, 11 and 12, where God shows Jeremiah the almond tree. You see folks, careful Bible reading will tell you that of the many botanical trees in the land of Israel, 
in the Bible, God selects seven of them. Among them, the fig tree, the vine tree, the olive tree, etc., etc., and then also the elm tree. But in verse 12 of Jeremiah 1, God then likens the elm tree to, I'll speed up my word. My word will not delay. My word will not slouch like Lot's wife did. That is why when there was an issue and a matter to be settled, the matter and issue of the elders in the days of Israel in the wilderness saying to Moses, you take too much upon yourself. You and Aaron, your brother, and I suppose, including Miriam, who took the tambourine and led the songs immediately after they crossed the Red Sea. They were saying, Moses, you and Aaron and your sister, this is too much of a family leadership thing. Such spirits have not died. Luckily, I have no son, no sons. So there is no way, in a natural way, I can be accused of trying to pass the leadership to my son or sons. Because the ministry is not an inheritance. The ministry is not the royal house. The ministry is a calling. However, in number 17, you are going to read it. God then called for Moses and said, Tell the elders of Israel, to all bring their rods to the tabernacle. I will prove whom I have chosen and anointed to be leaders. I'm very sure that among those elders, they started thinking the mahogany tree, I'll get me a rod from there. A very beautiful type of tree that makes beautiful furniture. Another one may have said, No, 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 I'll try teak. And another one probably said, Oh, no, I'm going to try the palm tree. Another one said, Oh, no, 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 I'm going to try. The pine tree. On and on and on you can suggest the botanical trees, but I say, but God must have revealed to Moses to tell Aaron, let Aaron bring the what? The almond tree. I'll tell you why. While we are still in the season of death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord, we may safely conclude that the argument of the rods was around this time of the year. I'll tell you why. While traveling through the land of Israel, I've come to notice that as winter sweeps over the land of Israel and all the trees stand their steps down to the root for safety to survive the wintry weather. When springtime comes around like now, all oh, this blessed my heart, 
the first tree that comes to blossom, yes, you've guessed it, is the almond tree. So when they all lay their rods in that tabernacle, we read that Aaron's rod, the almond rod, it budded and blossomed and bore fruit in one night. It resurrected while the others remained dead. The almond tree was therefore a type of our Lord Jesus Christ who resurrected, but in this case, resurrected the other almond trees that were looking forward to his coming in the Old Testament, and the rest of the people are still dead unto this day, awaiting the second resurrection to be called up for judgment. If you touch on the matter of trees, I'm going to quote Mark 11 and verse 13. I had read this scripture for years before, and I'm going to share with you how marvelous God is. The Bible says Jesus came to a fig tree and expecting fruit. But what really had me puzzled was in verse 13, it says, and yet, it was not yet time for fruit. I couldn't put this together. How could God who created these trees, who set the laws in them, when to bud to blossom and when to bring fruit, how could he come to a tree, the fig tree, knowing it was not season, it was not time for it to bear fruit and then require fruit. And when he didn't find fruit, the Bible says he cursed the tree. I couldn't put it together. But while traveling through the land of Israel, which is why the prophet said, traveling through that Bible land makes the Bible a new book. In the many trips, among one of them, we found ourselves in Israel at the time when Jesus cursed the fig tree. Making an inquiry, this was an alarming finding for me. But there are three types of fig trees and you at the Willows know them very well. We preached over them many times. The three types of fig trees. Typing Hosea 9 verse 10. The early fig. Typing the first exodus. Then we preach to you that the middle type of fig fits in with the second exodus in the days of Jesus. Then we showed you and shared with you that the third type of fig tree, still typing Israel, is the one that Jesus said, when you see the fig tree budding, Israel becoming a nation, that's the third type. That one fits today under the third exit. So going back to the fig tree he visited, in his days, are you reading between the lines? When he did not find fruit, I said, but how could he curse it? Well, he did pronounce some judgment on Israel under the second exodus when they did not produce, are you ready? The pre-fruit. I was pleasantly surprised to learn that this type of fig tree must produce a pre-fruit before the real fruit. The size of the pre-fruit 
is the size of a throat lozenge. You know when you have a cold? That smoke. When you find that pre fruit, which will postpone hunger for a little while, the pre fruit, the first fruit of that fig tree, is a sign that when its season comes along, it'll bear real fruit. So if you don't find the pre fruit, it's dead already. It means that when its season comes around, it will not produce fruit. No wonder it was cursed. Pre-fruit, first fruit. And do not forget that the end time prophet preaches us as the bright tree. When he takes those four little insects, those four little worms in the book of Joel, he shows how through the church ages, those four little creatures were destroying the tree of God, while the four beasts around the throne were countering them to bring the tree of God to fruition in this day. That is why Luke 18, 8, Jesus asked us in the last days, it says, when the Son of Man returns and we have seen him manifesting himself through the end time prophet, he asks the question, will I find faith? Luke 18, 8, will the Son of Man find faith? Will there be a people who by revelation have seen a son of man demonstrating the son of man? Therefore, we are supposed to be showing those first fruits before the harvest that is called the rapture. But I wanted to notice something hidden in the scriptures right there in Leviticus 23. There are two wavings of the first fruit. Yes. When you read Leviticus 23, from verse 10 to verse 14, you are going to read it, Leviticus 23, verse 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14, and you read very carefully, there was a waving of the first fruits before it is ground to change into another form. And then it is waved again before the people. That is why you will see how Christ is waved before Israel on the Passover Friday. He's standing there before Pilate. He's standing there for the public. But as soon as he's risen, we've just read the scripture, he comes back and he waves himself only before the believers. I repeat, Thomas, only before the believers. We are not yet at the Feast of Wave Offering, which will come 50 days from the resurrection. We are caught between the waving of the first fruit and then on Pentecost, he's going to wave himself in the form of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This is deep. So the first fruits come in and then they are ground into powder, meaning they change form. That is why he did not resurrect and come in the body he died in because the body he died in couldn't walk through the wall. Yet it was the same shape. 
Yet it had the same wounds. This is deep. But he walked through the doors while they were within. That is such a deep mystery. He even says to Thomas, come and feel the wound. But he's in a body that traveled at the thought. This is deep. Let us proceed. During the feast of the first fruits, you go read it. It was required that the bread be baked with barley. The first fruit bread. You see, barley is a relative of wheat. But barley matures seven weeks before wheat. That is why you're going to see how that the first fruit, before it is now waved again under wave offering, not wave, the other wavings are spoke about. There is 49 days between first fruit and wave offering. Seven weeks. Seven times seven is 49. Bali ripens seven weeks before wheat. That is why, now you be very careful. In 2 Kings 4 and 42, you read of a miracle that happened in the Old Testament involving barley bread. When a few loaves were brought in 2 Kings 4, 42, and the barley loaves were multiplied. Does that ring a bell? Yes, it should. Of course, in John 6, verse 9, the crowds are gathered. They come to Jesus. They say, with what are we going to feed these people? He tests them. He says, you feed them. <laughs> Oh my, these tests. They said, we haven't got enough money to buy bread to feed all these people, but there is a young boy among us who did not forget his lunch. He's got a few loaves of barley. There you go now. He's got a few loaves of barley. Jesus then showed that he is that one who multiplied barley in 2 Kings 4, 42. We are not told what prayer he prayed, but he said, now go feed them. And from those barley loaves, from the young little boy, the multitudes were fed. See, scripture is superhuman. It can't be man who wrote the Bible. Like somebody said, Jesus turned water into wine, so why, did, why don't you drink, Brother George? I said, I'll drink the day you bring water and you pray over it. If it turns into wine, I'll join you. So barley bread was multiplied in the Old Testament and barley bread was multiplied in the new feast of first fruits, my brother. That is why if you are a Christian and you never witness and you never win souls, it bothers me because what kind of barley bread are you? Barley must multiply. <laughs> so if you read Leviticus 23, 11 and 16, it is Acts 2 verse 1. Because you see how the first fruit and wave offering, these two feasts, both of them are kept on a Sunday. That's why the Bible says the morning after the Sabbath. God was already projecting Sunday before it comes to the Gentiles. 
That's why Jesus rose on a Sunday. And 50 days after he rose, when the baptism of the Holy Ghost came upon them in Acts 2 verse 1, it was on a Sunday morning. So that scriptures could run in correlation. Barley bread was all a type of Jesus Christ. That is why in Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer, he speaks in a very veiled form. He says, give us, you must pray, give us this day, the other version is, give us day by day our bread. You're not so much asking for the bread in the bread basket. <laughs> That's what you thought it was. You were walking on the natural level. When you lift up in the Holy Spirit revelation, that prayer is to ask for a revelation of Christ every day. Give us day by day our bread. Give me Christ revelation every day. And that's why Jesus said, I am that bread. In John chapter 6. That's why our blessed Lord Jesus said. In Matthew 4 and 4. Men shall not live by bread alone. He's talking of the one that uh, people are stampeding to get from the bakery. There was a stampede in Kenya. If the lockdown is not lifted up soon, when people go hungry, they lose their mind. It's recorded in the book of King. When food was scarce in the city, a man said, mockingly, even if God opened the windows of heaven, shall this thing be? The prophet said, with your eyes you will see it. But you, with your mouth, you will not taste it. And it's true. The day the lockdown was lifted, the people were so hungry. And that was the day when the four leprous men said, we have found bread. The man himself was running toward the gate, having forgotten the prophet's prophecy. He saw the bread, but he was stampeded. And did not taste of it. So let us pray, dear folks, that our beloved government will take a wise decision, lest it be too late. Yes, man shall not live by bread alone. So we see in Leviticus 23 11 the first waving. And we understand now, as I've left the thought, but I'm coming back to it. It was waved for the first time, but it was going to change form. It was Christ who was going to change form and go up to the Father. John chapter 14, so that the Comforter can come down. The comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, is not another personality. It is the same first fruit, ground, meshed, changed, changes form, and is going to be waved before the people on the day of Pentecost. That is why you understand how that there is going to be a second waving, and here it comes in Leviticus 23, 20. You go and read it. It's waved over there, and then it's waved again in Leviticus 23, 20. So you see, unless you place these feasts of Leviticus properly, you will not see Christ. You will not understand the return of Israel to the homeland, feast of the trumpets, 
you will not see how Christ is our Passover, he's our leavened bread, he's our first fruits of those that had slept. He is our way will bring the Holy Ghost. You will not see all those things, how they apply in the different forms. You will not understand the three pools as they are hidden in Leviticus 23. The first pool, you read it in Leviticus 23, 14 and 17. There it is. Leviticus 23, verse 14 and 17. God groups it together in its different pools. Why pools? Because people would be pulled from all over Israel to come to Jerusalem. There's a pool from the north, the Sea of Galilee. They are pulled from the south, the Judean desert. They are pulled from the east to the west. They are pulled. It's a pool, and that's why he said, "Unleavened bread." Just together with Passover, they follow each other. You know that Passover and unleavened bread pull them to Jerusalem. Then they go. He says, pull them again. Then they go. He said, now you're going to have to pull them again. Unleavened bread, first fruits, and in gathering. You read it right, right there in uh, said Leviticus correction, Exodus 23, 14 and 17. Correct that for me. Exodus 23, 14 and 17. Not Leviticus. There God gives you the three feasts of the eight feasts and how three times your males must appear before me, saith the Lord. Now, let us put a pause. We'll come back to the feast. What went wrong between Cain and Abel? Remember, both boys were very religious, says the prophet. The prophet says for Cain to build an altar, he was not an infidel. He knew about altars. He knew about sacrifices. But what made the difference? Why did one bring a lamb and the other one brought fruit? The day this struck me, I almost wept. How that revelation is the demarcation between elect and non-elect. I repeat that statement. Revelation is the demarcation between elect and non-elect. You see, Cain, in all his zeal, he swapped the feast. There you go. He brought the first fruits of his ground before Passover. <laughs> and Abel knew that Passover, the lamb, dies before first fruit. Say amen, somebody. So let us not swap these feasts. Let us apply them appropriately and we shall reap the positive results of it. Now, as we go a little deeper, for those who love depth, when you study Leviticus 23, very carefully, I'm going to give you the verses. You don't read the Bible like a newspaper. You are going to find that every feast of the seven feasts is identified with fire, except the eighth one. Whoa, I repeat. When you read carefully, you will find out that the seven feasts of Leviticus 23, all seven are identified with fire, not the eighth one. Here are the verses. In Leviticus 23, verse 5, you will then compare it with 2 Chronicles 35, 13. 
Second Chronicles 35, 13 tells you that the Passover lamb had to be roasted with fire. So then it means verse 5 of Leviticus 23, fire for roasting. Verse 8, you will read fire. Verse 13, fire. Verse 18, fire. Verse 25, fire. Verse 27, fire. Verse 36, fire. You have finished seven feasts. Verse 5, verse 8, verse 13, verse 18, verse 25, verse 27, verse 36. By the time you read Holy Convocation, it says build, rather it says nothing about fire. Why? Because those of you who know that the Holy Convocation, Brother Branham preached it as the eighth feast, eternity. When we come into eternity, we don't need fire to cleanse anything. Because the millennium, the seventh feast, will be cleansed with fire after the judgment. And Brother Benham does a very marvelous thing in the future home. Somewhere around paragraph 445, the technicians will find it. If I miss it, I'll miss it by just one paragraph. Future home, 1964. Either paragraph 445 or 446 comes to memory. Brother Benham then showed that these feasts, the first seven, can be run in the seven churches by saying, we are worshiping now under the Feast of Tabernacles, the seventh church age. If you punch in the words Feast, Tabernacles, seventh church age, what paragraph is it, my dear technician? Aha, thank you. They will put it up for you. Thank you very much. They found it. Now, by putting the Feast of Tabernacles as the seventh church age, Brother Bellum does something most marvelous, therefore. He's showing you that these feasts can run more than one way. Let's quickly refresh. They run as per the natural feasts that Israel observed since the days of Moses. And they are still observing them in their blindness. And then they run as Christ, who is, as I've said, our Passover, our leavened bread, our first fruits of them who resurrected, our wave offering, baptism of the Holy Ghost, our trumpet, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, our original atonement and our tabernacle because he became Emmanuel to tabernacle with us and he becomes our feast of holy gathering where two or more are gathered. Holy convocation in my name. I'll be there. But then, Brother Branham runs it to the church ages. That's your third application. Then the fourth application Israel is called back to the homeland by the Feast of Trumpets. Now they are waiting for the atonement of Messiah. And the prophet says they'll be with us in the millennium. Church ages, page 41. And then they will be our attendants in the new city. See, that's another application. This is what I call Pendulum revelation. Please, you won't find the quote now. I'm saying I call it pendulum. It swings this way. It swings that way. It swings this way. It swings that way. Well, what an observation the prophet swinging it for us. Now let's go back to 
the other matter of Thomas Weekend, first fruits and the Lord. When you read Leviticus 23, 13, and I'm pausing so that our technicians will put it up for you, Leviticus 23, 13, and I'd like to read it with you this time. In Leviticus 23, 13, this is what we read concerning this feast of first fruits. It says, or rather wave of free, a big part. Because in verse 11, you shall wave it for the Lord, and then the priest shall wave it. Verse 12, and you shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf and he lamb. That's Christ now, he lamb. Without blemish, there's your sinful, sinless, I beg your pardon, sinless sacrifice for the sinful me and you. But in verse 13, it says, and the meat offering thereof shall be two tenth deals, two upon ten. Watch now, write it down on your notepad. Two tenth deals thereof of fine flour, and you read the rest. Those of you who are far better than I am in arithmetic know that you can reduce two over 10, and it becomes one over five. What is the significance of this two tenth deal, fine flour, that when you reduce it, becomes one upon five? Yes. You find it in Leviticus 27, 31. That if a man held back his tenth, for whatever excuse, I'm glad my wife and I are here in the UK, <laughs> and you are down there in South Africa, so you can't say he's preaching tithes. I'm preaching the word. You will find that if a man or woman held back their tithes, the scripture requires in verse 31 that when they bring those tithes, they must add one fifth of those tithes. So if you were to give 20 rand and you didn't give it on time, when you give it late, it's 25 rand because one fifth of 20, correct, is five. So now you must give 25. So it doesn't benefit you to be late. But these things were not written for money. They were not written so that, you know, I don't want to call these false prophets names for them to make money out of you. Behind these figures and the natural is a deeper meaning. Are you ready? So you must add one fifth to the one tenth. Did not the scripture say, bring in to my storehouse? Notice what must come into, I emphasize, into the storehouse. Bring tithes and offerings, correct? Into. Did not the prophet of God in 1959-05-25, images of Christ, paragraph 156, and only quote, I repeat, I've been promising the willows one of these days I'll preach a sermon on these ones of quotes. They don't appear here, they're everywhere, you just find one place. In 1959-05-25, Images of Christ, paragraph 156, the prophet said, God requires a tenth from man. I'm quoting it out of memory. Then he says, a tenth of all the world's harvest through the ages 
will be the elected that God has called. Watch how he then shows you that the natural tithes is not to make a man rich. They are a type of the elected bride. It's something you do physically. But by revelation, you are saying, I'm doing it not because I am forced to do it. Because I love to do it. Because it speaks of me. Like a man had to give a tenth of his harvest, God is going to harvest one-tenth of all the world's harvest. All the way from Adam to the last one. That bride, that one tenth, that elect is going to harvest them into his store. So, where are the offerings? Who are the offerings then? And who are the penalties? Here it comes before we close. Since we have emphasized that the tenth and offerings, the scripture is very clear, they must come into the house. It is therefore very clear from this quote that the bride is a one tenth. And somebody else must be with them in the same house, the 144,000, the offerings. So who are the penalties then? The ones who come late. The nations in the book of Revelation who will bring their glory into the story. They come way after you, the one-tenth bride, and the offerings, 144,000, are in the city. They come and they bring their honor into the city. Tithes, offerings, and late penalties. Where do I find the quote that the 144 will be with us in the house? If you punch in the words, and our technicians will do it for us, eunuchs, plural, E-U-N-U-C-H-S, space, bridal from bride, bridal, attendance with a double T and an S at the end, the quote jumps up in the church ages where the prophet tells us that the 144 are the bridal attendants. So they are going to be with us in the city. Like tithes and offerings come into the house. There you go. There you go. Now give me another 10 minutes or so before we close. Yes. In case you want the scripture of those who will be giving their honor, bringing it into the city, wherein is Christ the bride and the attendants, 144. The scripture is Revelation 21, verses 24 and 26. Revelation 21. Verses 24, stroke, and 26. So then, we have seen how in John 20 and 26, our opening scripture, correct? How that God's mercy reaches for Thomas. And Christ then provokes him before it close. Because he knows that some believers are very slow of heart to believe. Did not Jesus say that? Oh, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have said. We have people in the message today, they struggle to believe all that the prophets have said. So help us, Lord. May we be counted among those who are quick of heart, not slow of heart. So Christ provokes Thomas by saying, your faith is low. 
Your faith is weak, but I'm going to challenge it. I'm going to provoke it into action. Come here. Enjoy a personal touch. Before I close, you may have been sitting for years at the willows. And how many times has the Holy Ghost not come down at the willows? How many times hasn't God proved himself in more than one way at the willows? And you are still slow of heart to believe. You are still a Thomas. You are still saying, well, I'm not sure. This service on the 19th of April, 2020, let it be a provocation to you during this Thomas weekend. See how God says in Genesis 2.18 to provoke any bachelor. I'm closing. God knows how to provoke a young man who is still in a coma. Adam was put into a deep sleep. The years are piling up on you, brother. Sisters are coming and going. So God has a way to provoke by saying it's not good for a man to be alone. <laughs> After God had been sealing every day of his creation with, and behold, it was good. Behold, it was good. Behold, it was good. Suddenly God speaks in the negative because brother is still sleeping. I can hear you laughing at the willows, but I'm not making a joke. I'm trying to wake you up. So, why don't you get provoked, my brother? Like you've heard me say before, even though you're alone, maybe you don't even have a house yet. Well, be provoked. Go and buy that doormat that says, welcome to our house. Yes, you're alone, but buy the one that says, to our house. And if you are a sister, why don't you also, you don't have a house maybe, you don't even have a job, but you want a husband, yes? Go out there to house and home and buy yourself a pair of salt and pepper. I've seen them. They are shaped like husband and wife. One. Provoke yourself. Or... Go buy a coffee or tea mug that is written his, hers. You've got to provoke something positively if you want results. Look at Isaac in Genesis 22 verse 7. Look how he provokes for God to prophesy the Lord will provide himself a lamb. He provokes by saying in verse 7 of Genesis 22, My father. Here is wood, here is the fire, Abraham is holding the knife, then he provokes the scriptures. He says, but where is the ram? Where is the land? He provokes his father to prophesy, and the prophecy is, the Lord will provide himself. Double meaning. And there it was a ram caught in the thicket. A ram whose horns were caught in a thorn tree. And Friday before last, the Passover weekend, we were reminded of Calvary. What did the soldiers put on the head of Christ? A crown of thorns. There's your ram whose head is caught in a thicket of thorns. Pharaoh, be very careful, Pharaoh, because Pharaoh says in Exodus 10, 28, he says to Moses, what? Don't let me, my own words, don't let me see your face again. See my face no more or else you will die. And Moses remarks, Mm -hmm. Well spoken, because Moses never looked at Pharaoh's face thereafter. It was Pharaoh who died in Psalms 136 verse 15. 
I repeat now, Psalms 136, verse 15. The scripture is careful to say, Pharaoh, horses, chariots were drowned in the sea. So Pharaoh provoked his own death. In 1 Samuel 16 and 13, David knew he's the legitimate king, but he didn't push for nothing. Real leaders don't stew, fight, bite, and tear to get the position. God knows who's who. David merely provoked the scripture in 1 Samuel 16, 13. He said, of course, you read it from verse 10. He says, Saul shall descend into battle, and he shall die. My brother, that is prophetic. It was to provoke the oil he was anointed with from the horn. You can provoke certain scriptures in your life. You don't have to sit back and be defeated. Why don't you start reading the Bible and finding the promises pertaining to you and provoke them? Look at David in 1 Samuel 17 when he stood before Goliath. 1 Samuel 17, 36. He says, as the lion and the bear, so shall be this Philistine as one of them. God is waiting at this time for believers of the message to go into provocation mode. Job 19, 25 and 26. I know my Redeemer liveth. What? And he provokes. He says, in the last days he shall stand upon the earth and in my flesh I shall see God. He provoked the very resurrection of Matthew 27. Let's provoke scriptures. In Jeremiah 28, 11. Jeremiah gives a prophecy. Hananiah opposes it. And Hananiah says, no, it'll be not as you say. And in verse 16 of Jeremiah 28, Jeremiah then says, in one year, you, Hananiah, will be dead. So some people are foolish. They provoke the wrong side of scripture. They attack leaders who are anointed and called. And they don't realize by so doing, they are calling for their early spiritual death. That's why God provoked you in Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Give me five minutes. God says, call on me, provoke me, call on me, and I will answer. That is why 2 Kings 7, verse 2, we spoke about it. The man who said, even if God should open the windows, there'll be no bread here. Second Kings 7 verse 2. He provoked his own death. Now Malachi 3 verse 10. I'm pausing. Technicians will put it up for you. Malachi 3 verse 10. Why don't you provoke these blessings of Malachi 3 verse 10? God tells you how to provoke it. In James 4, verse 8, God says, provoke me. Make a step forward and see whether I will not make two or three toward you. Draw near unto me and I'll draw near to you. Make one step, God will make three. God is waiting for your provocation. That is why Brother Benham even addresses women who are barren, childless, You've tried everything, brother, you've tried. You and the wife tried. You tried this, you tried that. You tried interfertilization, you tried tablets, injections, it didn't work. The prophet says, 
1959, again, images of Christ. The same message where he said the bride is one ten elected ones. In images of Christ, paragraph 33, he says, why don't you try the adoption way? He says, adopt a baby. He says, very soon the sister will have her own baby. Provoke it. How about the little girl, brother Billy Paul, our dear brother, testifies about that came into the prayer line. She was born with clubbed feet. By the shape of her shoes and her walking, you could tell she had a walking problem. But under her arm, she had a box of brand new shoes. And watch how Brother Benham provoked her faith. When she came in the prayer line, said, what did you come here for? Said, well, if you pray for me. Yes, and what if I pray for you? What's that in the box? She said, a pair of brand new shoes. What's the provocation? So what are you planning to do with a pair of brand new shoes? What's the provocation? She said, I'll wear them after you pray for me. And she got her wish. Sometimes we come to church with hands hanging and we leave with hands hanging. Some of you come with hands hanging and you leave with hands in your head, defeated. Is because you know not how to provoke. On Easter Friday, I remember giving you the scripture and the Psalms, John 19, 28 and 31. To provoke the scripture, Jesus said, I thirst. Do you know that Jesus provoked Calvary? Yes, in Luke 22, 44. He prayed in agony. And the Bible says his sweat droplets were like blood. He provoked Calvary. And Brother Benham says in 1957 communion, part of 44, he says, Jesus died more in Gethsemane than on the cross. So Gethsemane was a provocation of the cross calvary. I spoke to a doctor many, many years ago. I was still working for Siemens at the time. I said, is it possible for a man to sweat droplets of blood? He says, yes. When a man comes under great agony, and this was a doctor who studies blood, hematosis, he says, when a man is under great agony, and we study it, but we've never seen it, I said, thank God, because it only happened with the Lord Jesus. In Luke 22, 44, it's called hematimosis. Like you say, osmosis. Hematimosis. Under great agony, the water in your blood separates. And as you sweat, droplets of blood oozes out. Think of it. What he went through for you and for me. I'm going to close. When next time we get to speak about the Feast of Atonement, I will remind you that day that during the Feast of Atonement, they don't re-kill the lamb. They don't sacrifice no lamb at all. The Bible says, afflict your souls, weep. It took me a long time to understand why is no, why is there no bullock, no red heifer, no he goat or she goat, no sacrifice. They must weep for the lamb they killed under the Passover. I said, I see it. Israel is gathered in the homeland by the seven trumpets, or let's say six, because the seventh one is our going home, becoming Moses and Elijah, but the trumpets have gathered them home. They are waiting for the last trump, like we are waiting for the last one. And they are not going to re-crucify Christ. Actually, when they see him, they will see him crucified already. 
Zechariah said. They will say, what are those wounds in your hands and feet? You see the lamb already crucified. And when they realize that their Passover lamb was already crucified, they will weep for a lamb already crucified. I said, I see it. That is why as we close, very close in scripture, our technicians are going to put up Ezekiel 48 and 20. Maybe 21 if you so wish. Ezekiel 48 and 20. Very strange scripture as I close. How is it that Brother Benham says, Ezekiel 48, we are already in the millennium. But in Ezekiel 48, 20 and 21, you read about oblation, oblation, oblation. The word oblation is sacrifice. It sounds like lambs are still going to die in the millennium until you remember and balance the quotes that Brother Benham says there'll be no death in the millennium. So then how is it that it sounds like there's going to be a relation and he lamb and those lamb? It's in memoriam. We will be looking back and rejoicing that the perfect he lamb, the perfect red heifer, the perfect he goat, whatever Christ is in the Old Testament, we will look back and we will remember in our memory the good things that he died for us. Amen. Hallelujah, say, say hallelujah, sir. So we've done, showed you how those feasts apply in more than one way. Who can say amen? And that quotation of, we now worship under the Feast of Tabernacles. Yes, you were right, dear technician. It's Future Home, paragraph 454. Four. I'm closing with this. Please, on this Thomas weekend, I pause again. On this day, the 19th of April, 2020, do you know, as I close, that God has provoked us last week? Yes. You can Google it if you had missed it. On the 7th of April, that's last week, a supermoon appeared in the sky. And what was amazing with the supermoon was, they say it was the closest to the Earth since 1948. Does that date remind you of something? Did not Israel become a nation recognized by the world in 1948? Since that time, the supermoon of the 7th of April was the closest to the earth. So why didn't they touch the earth? The moon was social distance. <laughs> Amen. My last scripture is Isaiah 5. Verse 8, even God favors social distancing. The reason why, among many reasons, the coronavirus is decimating New York, it's because Isaiah 5, verse 8, and you will read it. God is wise in his decisions. Social distancing does help. So, Thomas, on this Thomas weekend, why don't we touch him the right way? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. You can't touch him without faith. And seven thunders have been revealed to give the bride that faith by which we should touch him. Now I close with a bomb of a statement. Did not Jesus say in Matthew 19 and 30, the first shall be last and the last shall be first? And the prophet says, that's the order of the resurrection. So the first, Paul, 
in this resurrection we are awaiting is going to rise last. So who's going to rise first then in our day? Come on now, come on now, Willows. If the first shall be last and the last shall be first, and Paul was the first and is going to rise last, who's going to rise up first in this hour? I leave you with that thought. He is risen. Thomas, on this day, the 19th of April, 2020, eight days after he rose, within the scriptures, touch him. God bless you. Shalom. Shalom, shalom, Jerusalem. Jews.